perhaps one of the hardest things that you and I will do today is walking the talk. There seems to be a gap in our lives between talking the talk and walking the walk. Whether or not you're talking about the physical space where you want your physical body to become healthier and you, you do the talk and saying, I, I want to have a, a trainer to help my, my physical and the right nutrition. We say the right thing, but then walking the talk. Maybe it's in a, a marriage. Maybe it's in your finances. And even in the spiritual space, we gather like this. Churches, Christians gather like this, and we talk the talk. We sing the songs. We offer the prayers. But the challenge, right, is walking the talk. Now, we have good intentions, and we often judge ourselves by our intentions, but others, they judge us by our actions. So how do we build a bridge from talking the talk to walking the talk? Jesus has much to say about this. If you've got your copy of God's Word, you can join me in Matthew chapter 25. And this morning, wherever you might be, whether it's in your personal life and it's a marriage or it's your career and you want to move from just having a good talking game to actually living it out, Jesus is going to step in and guide us and direct us. And as Christ followers, stepping out into our world and moving from just talking it to walking it is going to change our city, our county, perhaps your family, your relationships. If there's a common denominator that I often hear from people who aren't Christ followers, our neighbors, our coworkers, family and friends, they often say about us who are Christians, they'll use the hypocrite word, but what they're really describing is they talk the talk, but they really don't walk the walk. So how can we this morning let God's word and Jesus guide us forward to enjoy the kind of life because we don't want the duplicity. We want our talk and our walk to be one in the same. So Jesus begins to speak to this. There's a conversation, there's a dialogue in Matthew chapter 25 about what does it really mean to follow after Jesus? How, 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 how does it look? And notice what he says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, now Jesus often referred to himself as the Son of Man, it is Jesus. He has not yet gone to the cross. He's not died on the cross for our sins. He hasn't been buried, right? The resurrection hasn't happened yet. But he's speaking of a future moment, the second coming of Jesus, when Jesus Christ comes the second time and sets up his kingdom, right? So he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate the people from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So Jesus comes back, and there's these two groups of people, uh, one on each side. And notice how he continues in verse 33. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right. Again, Jesus is teaching his disciples what does it look like as his followers not to just talk the talk, but to walk the talk in everyday life. They want to know how can we walk this out in our everyday life? So he's given this illustration. He's saying, okay, when I come back and set up my kingdom, there's going to be two groups of people, one on each side of me. And then he begins to describe. Look what he says. Then the king will say, verse 34, to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me 
I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous, this group of people on this side, will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needed clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? And then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of these, the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He's, he's helping them to begin to see that the talk and the walk have to come together. That he, he was hungry and he gave me something to eat and I was thirsty and you gave me something to, to drink and, and I didn't have any clothes and you, you clothed me and, and, and I was sick and, and you took care of me and ultimately, right, I was imprisoned and you visited me. There are churches meeting all across our city and our county and our state and our country. There's churches gathering all around the globe. As a local church here in Ocala, we have a mission. It's our purpose. It's who we are and it's what we do. We partner with people to discover that in Christ we have hope. The world is looking for hope. We believe that the hope that people are looking for, the ultimate hope, the greatest satisfaction is in a relationship with Jesus. That's our, our mission. It's our purpose. The vision, in other words, as we do this missional work, as we step out in 3G, as we are missionally in our community, the vision, how we see a preferred future is, because we partner with people discover in Christ we have hope, what we hope to see, the vision to see is that people will love God and they'll love people and they'll love God and they'll love people and they'll love God and they'll love people and they'll love God. Think about whatever pressure point that's in our society whatever negative image that you saw on the news this week if you would take two steps back and if people would love God and love people whatever that negative news was would have never happened it is the ultimate game changer loving people loving God and loving people Matthew chapter 22 the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. God has us here to make the world better and brighter. But can we just be honest for a moment? There are a lot of crazy, weird people in the world. I mean, I mean, I get it. And it's like, you, you scratch your head and you say, man, I, I hear what you're saying, Mark. I know the Bible says all that kind of stuff, but my goodness, they don't want to have Mother's Day no more. They want to have birthing parent day. I'm supposed to love them? Oh, come on, Mark. That's not really what I mean. I mean ah. Here's what God says in 1 John chapter 4. If anyone boasts, I love God, which I would think in a gathering like this, we would boast towards that. Online, we've gathered this morning, we've declared in song and in prayers that you love God. If my life were to end or your life were to end, you would like for someone, a family or friend, to come and stand at your memorial service and you'd love for them to say, John loved God. Mark loved God. Charlie loved God. God, we, we, we would boast about, I, I, I want people to believe, I want to live my life in such a way that people would say, Mark loved God. But notice what happens next. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or his sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. <laughs> no, those aren't Mark's words. I wonder what happened if we stopped all the social media bickering and fighting because somebody wants a Mother's Day to be a birthing parent day. I don't understand it. 
I don't get it. It seems irrational to me. But listen, my ideology isn't shaped by what's happening in the culture. It's shaped because I'm a follower of Jesus, and he's called us not to just talk the talk. He's called us to step out and to walk the talk. Could you imagine how everything begins to change in our culture? If we, Christ followers, who believe that our lives have been changed because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what if we stepped out this week and we began to build a bridge, the gap between what I say on Sunday and how I live Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it became shorter. Back to 1 John chapter 4. If he won't love the person he can see, even the craziest, the wildest, weirdest human being, if he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God that he can't see? This command, it's not a suggestion, this command we have from Christ is blunt. (laughs) Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. Okay. The condition that we find ourselves in the world, in our country today, has got nothing to do with the politics of the day. It has everything to do with the gap between those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus, of what we say and how we live. Because of Jesus Christ and his resurrection, because of the power of God, as we step out, we have the Holy Spirit, the power of the resurrection to impact everyday lives. But we can't just live it. We've got to speak it and walk it. Model it. It's a challenge. Matthew 24 or 22, the story continues. So, right, there's Jesus, and he talks about these two groups of people. He comes back, right? He's talking about how do we, how do we bridge this gap between what we say and how we live. Then he will say to those on his left. Now, before we go any farther, let's make sure we don't be taking this context out because the people are like, well, you know, he said the people on the right, they're the good guys, and the people on the left, they're not the good guys. So you know, God, this is a subliminal message that God is sending. This Bible is not speaking. Jesus ain't a Democrat, and Jesus ain't a Republican. He ain't an independent. He's not a socialist. He's not a communist. And he's not a capitalist. He God. And he for everybody discovering that the hope that you're looking for and the solution for the pain of sin is in Jesus. So then he'll say to those on the left, depart from me. (laughs) I'm going to get a text or an email. Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared. Some of you are thinking of people's names right now on the left. Don't be thinking that. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison. You did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick of in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And hey, I want everybody to meet Jesus. I want everybody to be in his favor. I want everybody, I don't want anybody to miss out on Jesus. So if you're taking notes, here's a couple things. Here's the problem. There is a gap between what we say and how we, we live. That might be true in a, in a personal relationship. It might be true in your finances, in your career trajectory, in your educational pursuit, in athletics, whatever. These principles will apply in your life no matter what area we're talking about. It is a human dilemma. There is a gap between what we say and what we do. And it's also true spiritually. But Jesus teaches us how to bridge that gap. So the first thing we have to understand is following Jesus is visible. 
all of this list, right? Hungry and thirsty and and needing clothes and uh, sick and in prison. It's visible. You can can see it. The the two groups of people, it 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 was outlined by this group, they walked the talk. And this group, they just talked the talk. This group, they they moved beyond just having good intentions and they let their actions match their good intentions. This group, they only stayed in their good intentions. Matthew chapter five and verse 14, the Bible says, you, Christ followers, if you're a Christ follower here, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And I understand some of you are like, okay, but Mark, my, my, my temperament, my personality, I'm a little bit more reserved. I'm a little bit more laid back. I understand from a temperament perspective, that's, that's who you are. But God in you will go over your temperament and help you step out into the world and to be light and to be salt and let people see how much you're enjoying following after Jesus. The Bible says in James chapter 2, on the big Bible on the screen, but someone will say, hey, you have faith and I have deeds. In other words, they're trying to compartmentalize this. Some people are going to just have the faith and it's going to be quiet, it's going to be more reserved and more personal. Over here, people are going to have deeds. It's more vocal, it's more outgoing, it's more public. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. He's beginning to bridge the gap. You believe that there is one God? Okay, that's good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Then he gives two visible illustrations. Number one, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Abraham had been praying forever for a son. God finally gives him a son. And then God, I don't totally understand it. God says, now sacrifice your son to me. Show me that I'm still first. You had been praying for, you had been hoping for, fill in the blank. And then God says, okay, show me. And so literally, visibly, Abraham takes his son to a place to offer him as a sacrifice. I don't totally understand it. It seems a little barbaric to me, but God is revealing that it happened. He took his son and he put him on an altar, tied him up, put the kindling under there. He was prepared. It was visible. We could see what Abraham was doing. Verse 22, you see that his faith and his actions, what he said and how he lived, were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. Jesus is teaching us this morning how we can bridge this gap between what I say and how I live. It's visible. And the scripture was fulfilled that says... Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. If that's not enough, he gives us another visible, visible. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? Before we go any farther, right, you did see, it said, Rahab the prostitute. Let me tell you something. God don't care about your past. He don't care what you've done. God used this prostitute to save the nation of Israel. He used her in a phenomenal way. And the problem is some of us, we look at that scripture and we're like, listen, I ain't no prostitute. That ain't, that ain't me. Some of us kind of think that, hey, God's lucky to have us on his team. Look what I can do and whatever. Hey, note to self, that little, that little white lie that you've offered to cover up whatever it was, it's just as necessary for Jesus to die on the cross for your little white lie as someone being a hoe. I, I'm, I'm just telling you the reason some of us, it's visible, it's, it's seen. It, it's, hey, hey I, I, I love you. I love me, I, I love us, right? And I know we've got guests here today. I'm glad that guests are here. But for us who call Church of Hope home, 
Like, we say, this is, our, this, is, this is my church, this is where I'm going. Hey, listen, something has to begin to change inside of us. Because it, I'm going to say it, it is shameful that you're more excited about the Florida Gators football team than you are about hearing men who you give so they are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ right now incarcerated as a prison. We get more excited about Gator football than we do about what Jesus is doing in a prison. I hope your heart's beating. I was talking to some millennials and Millennials can get a really bad rap, right? They kind of be looked at, you know, the kind of the 35 and younger or even to the 20s uh, that are now called Generation Z. Um, they're very much feelers. They want to see it. They want to feel it. Now, now you can have a conversation on whether or not you think that's relevant or rational, but, but they want to, here's the problem, is a lot of millennials, your children and grandchildren, my children, right, who are millennials, they're tired of you making sure that every meal that you always have, you always pray and thank Jesus for the food, but you're the most critical, backbiting, bitter person they know. It's visible. Following Jesus isn't some, dear God, thank me for this food, and Jesus say amen, and then you just go off on everything that's happening. It's visible. Rahab, she took a scarlet rope and she tied it together and let it out and let those spies, they were rescued. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's visible. There's a lot of things visible that you appreciate, a lot of creation sunrises and sunsets, right? Mountains and, and beach settings and whoever your favorite artist is and what they've painted and whatever. Just as much as we look at that creation and we celebrate because it's visible, let's start living our lives. Let's start bridging the gap between what we say with our lips and how we live with our lives. Following Jesus is visible. Here's the second thing if you want to write it down. is not only, we're talking about bridging the gap. What's the problem? We all know it's a problem. You're telling me that you wish you would show up differently? We all want to show up differently. We're all tired and fatigued of our own selves because we say it, we have good intentions, but we don't always follow through. So how do we, how, how do we begin to make adjustments? One, we understand that following Jesus is visible. It is about what's seen. Second, it's measurable. It's measurable. Hey, what's important in your life? You measure. Real estate agents, or you, those of you who are buying a house, you want to know what's the square foot. And depending on how much square foot, it's how much it's going to cost, how many bedrooms, how many baths. It, it's, it's measurable. Our finances are measurable. We, we measure up. Hey, how am I academically, my SAT and my ACT score? Hey, if you're a basketball player, it's, it's measurable. What's done, right? What's seen. Hey, listen, following Jesus is measurable. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And some of us don't understand God's word because we're like, well, right there it says it. It's God's grace. It's not by works. So I'm saved to be a lazy Christian the rest of my life. I'm a consumer. I'm going to soak it up and do nothing. That's why it's important we read the entire Bible. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, work hard to show the results of your salvation obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Here's the point on the big screen. I don't serve or work to get grace and favor with God. God through Jesus has already given me his grace and his favor. There's nothing that Mark David could have done, worked my way up in such a way, and I'm kind of acting for God, and I've done such good things, God looks down and says, my goodness, look at Mark David. Dude, you get in. What you did is so good. Or on the other side, what I've done is I was doing bad things and I kind of cleaned myself up and he says, oh, look at this. Hey, Gabriel, look at Mark David. All those things he used to do. Look what he it's, it's, it's He's picking up his underwear. He's not throwing it on the side of the corner. I mean, Linda's not cussing at him no more. Look what he's doing. It's kind of a good thing. Mark David, you can come in. L listen, my salvation 
My hope of heaven has nothing to do with anything that I've done or haven't done. It's all about God's grace that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in a tomb, and three days later, he became alive again. And putting faith in what he did for me saves me. So back to the point that's on the big screen. I don't serve or work to get grace and favor with God. I serve and work because I have God's grace and favor. That's not semantics. What Jesus is teaching them is that there is this gap between what we say and what we do, and he is bringing it closer together. So what are a couple action steps? There's a problem, there's a gap between what we say and what we do. We're learning that following Jesus is visible and it is measurable. So how do you and I take this word and step out in our everyday lives? And again, spiritual context, but it can also be a very personal context. You can take this, your health, your finances, um, whatever habit that you're trying to break, your professional career, everything you do is visible and measurable. You begin to focus on those things those areas and you begin to change so how do you do it number one is you have to look at your life and what do you see not her life not his life we do a personal inspection the bible says in second corinthians 13 and 5 examine yourself to whether you are in the faith test yourself One of the healthiest things that many of us could do today is to go home, and many of us have this. Maybe all of us have this. We have that whole snow white, wicked stepmother, wicked witch mirror on the wall. You know what I'm talking about? Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? The the, the difference is, is, is your mirror is a smartphone and you're looking at Twitter and Snapchat and TikTok and Facebook and it's all this mashed up comparison game. You gotta look here. If, if I'm going to change, if I'm gonna move from being somebody who just speaks it and somebody who begins to live it, I've gotta do a personal inspection, James chapter one and 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says God's word it it guides us it directs us it sets us up to win in this life and to win in eternal life Romans chapter 6 the Bible says for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with but this is hard right It's, it's hard to examine yourself it's easy to look at what they're not doing right or what they need to do better. Blame it on the pastor. Blame it on the church. Blame it on a politician. Blame it on a coach. Blame it on your parents. Blame it on the cat. Blame it on the dog. Blame it on the gerbil. Blame it on somebody, just not me. Because it's, it, it's hard. It, it is hard following after Jesus. We are so much like the little boy who spilt his coca-cola on the floor he's about age five age six we'll call his name is billy and he was being taught responsibility so he wanted to mop it up he says hey mom where's the mop she says it's on the back porch well it was nighttime and it's dark outside so he goes to the back porch and he looks outside and it's nighttime and it's dark time and it's scary time you know what i'm talking about it's fearful time and the idea of going out there and getting that mop and come back in he has really good intentions he wants to clean up the mess but that fear and that darkness that's out there. So he comes back in somewhat scared, nervous. He says, Mama, it's dark out there. It's fearful. I don't know what's out there. And Mom does what Mom does. Says, hey, Jesus is everywhere. Jesus is with you. Jesus will protect you. Jesus has got you. So he kind of smiles and gets a little bit of confidence. He goes back. He opens up the door. He sticks his out, head out to the back porch. He says, hey, Jesus. If you're out there, could you hand me the mop, please? It's scary out there. It's, it, it's fearful following after Jesus. But if we're ever going to bridge that gap between just talking the talk and walking the walk, 
we've got to examine ourselves and see where we are. People hear what we say, but they see what we do. And in the world, seeing is believing. Let me give you the last thing if you want to write it down. Is ultimately we, we serve to connect ourselves, you, me, us, and others to Jesus. So you, you, you examine yourself, where, where am I? How am I trusting after God? Where is it visible? How is it, how is it measurable? And we serve people ultimately, right? And the best way to kind of even check yourself is, okay, am, am I doing this for somebody to get something back for them? Or is this somebody who really doesn't have the capacity to serve me back? That's what Jesus was teaching. And for clarity, a, a guy asked me after the first gathering, he, he even seemed a little bit emotional. He said, you know, he said, this morning, as in this morning, somebody stopped him out in the community and said, hey, man, you got five bucks. I'm hungry. I didn't get no breakfast. And this individual pointed them towards Interfaith because you can get breakfast at Interfaith. You can get three square meals. Uh, our community, Ocala, Marion County, cares for people, and, and, and they can get food. And so this individual said, hey, listen, you can go to Interfaith. He said, oh, man, I was too tired. I couldn't get up in time. And, and the gentleman, was, he's like, I, I don't know if I'm feeling guilty. I mean, hey, hey, listen, sometimes being loving is saying no. Sometimes helping is hurting. Well, I just give the gift and whatever they go and do with it, that's fine. Have that conversation with Jesus one day. What you really want to say I'm too lazy to really develop a relationship with them and really understand what's going on. It's a lot easier for me to take my little $5 out and give it to them and get on my merry way and don't really care where they spend eternity. You gotta measure. It's gotta be visible. You gotta say, okay, who am I serving? Where, when, how am I serving somebody? What I find remarkable about this whole 3G serve day is not just all the different projects that are going to happen all over Ocala. You're going to get signed up through your small groups or out in the, the, the lobby area this morning. And we've been doing 3G since 2009. And initially, the idea was we are going to do it on a Sunday. Everybody's already coming to church anyways. What took me by surprise and the feedback that we get from people in the community is not the service project. It's not the idea that we go to a school and clean it all up or we go to a foster care family and fix something that's broken. All the different projects that you're gonna do, that we're gonna do. The feedback that we get from people in the community is this. Wow, I can't believe you guys do this on Sunday. That's your day. They're just like shocked that we wouldn't come sit on our blessed assurance and go out where they are. They think somehow this is our day. Like, this is what we do. We kind of come in here and we kind of sit and do our thing. The idea that we would go do this on our, that's the feedback. What are they saying? They're saying, wow, you really believe what you believe. This isn't just something that you talk about on Sunday. This is how you all live. I don't know where you might be on the dusty trail called life. I can tell you that life will always be at its best choosing to follow after Jesus. Now I get it in a gathering like this. Perhaps some are here and you've been kind of watching from a distance. Maybe, maybe someone who said they were a Christian had the right talk. They didn't have the right walk. Maybe they even hurt you. Maybe you were at a church or a pastor or a priest. Somebody who attached themselves to God showed up in a way that seemed so inconsistent and you're like, nah, I'm, I, I, no thanks for that, Jesus. It's important you're turning your back on Jesus. Understand that whoever that person was that was walking inconsistently or their 
walk wasn't matching their talk, they didn't die for you. That church that you're upset with, that church didn't die for you. That pastor and that priest didn't die for you. That denomination, they didn't die for you. Yeah, they hurt you. Yeah, it was wrong. Yeah, it it seemed like it was hypocritical. Yeah, it seemed like the distance between what they said and how they lived, it was so messed up. You don't want anything to do with it. I, I, I get it. But the invitation isn't to follow after a person or after a denomination. It's to follow after Jesus who loves you and died for you, was buried in a tomb, and three days later came back. If there ever was, or better said, the only pure example of one whose talk and walk matches perfectly is his name is Jesus. And when he said that he loved you so much, he stretched out his arms in action. It was visible. It was measurable. For three days, he was in the tomb. So this morning, if you've never begun a relationship with Jesus, examine your own heart and then choose to accept him. You can do that right where you're sitting online. Say, hey, God, it's me. Today, I choose Jesus. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died on that cross and you became alive again. Come into my life. And to those who are beginning a relationship with Jesus, welcome to God's family. Love to help you continue to grow in your faith. You can use the Connect card that's at your chair. Uh, fill that out. Stop by our, our guest center. Or just text the number on the screen. We want to help you grow in following after Jesus. Well, you've been sitting for a while. Why don't you stand with me? I'd love to pray over us. Um, I understand the challenge is real. It is for real. I get it, right? It's, I'm a guy standing here this morning, and I'm I'm bringing the talk, and about walk the talk, and then I'm going to get in my car. And I got a hard time. I mean, I want to get where I'm going to get, and most of the cow don't know where they're going. Right? And I'm just like, oh my goodness. And then the Spirit will come and say, Cummins, come on now. What's more important? You got to walk the walk. You got to drive the drive. Yeah, but God, I need to. <laughs> Someone asked me once, Charlie, hey, you know, other churches, kind of cool. They got like this little bumper sticker that says, follow me to name of the church or whatever. Why don't we do that at Hope? bad enough that I'm probably the only guy in town that's driving a light blue convertible with the top down and it's raining outside. People know, oh yeah, we know who that is. Hey, the the struggle is for real. But to those of us who are Christ followers, the Holy Spirit lives within us. And let Him guide you. Let Him direct you. And in those moments, when the gap begins to widen up, invite the Spirit to bring that gap closer. Because we all want this. We don't want there to be a distance. And we want people to discover hope in Jesus. Father in heaven, I love you. And I I thank you for this word. It has stressed us. It has challenged us this morning. But thank you. This word is eternal. Jesus, we want our talk to be matched with our walk. And so open up our eyes. Guide us and direct us this week. May each one of us live in a way that's authentic and it's real and it's fueled by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit who lives in us. Change me. Help me help us to love you, to love people, so that people will discover that there is hope in your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.